Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Fully Charged Live. Um, thank you so much for coming, everybody. You've come to the two o'clock chat where we're going to be talking about electrifying classic cars, a subject really close to my heart. Uh, it's the reason how I met Robert Llewellyn, actually, was because of a little electric car that I built back in 2013, something like that. Uh, but anyway, uh, I've brought some friends with me today. I'd like to introduce to you Dorian Hindmarsh. Uh, we've got Sally Pavlotsky here. We've got Richard Morgan. Uh, so please give them a warm welcome. First up, guys, just want to tell people what, what your background is. Um, Sally, you go first. Crikey. Okay, uh, my name's Sally. Uh, the Pavlotsky bit can be a bit confusing sometimes. Um, I come from an aftermarket background, then went to work for a major OEM. Uh, I've worked on two uh, pretty big prototype um, EVs from a... So OEM is an original equipment manufacturer like Aston Martin, JLR, etc. Um, and I'm a huge advocate for EV and EV classics. And uh, yeah, here today to obviously talk about the, uh, the area of electrifying T classics. T so that's Sally. Sally's done some very cool stuff. Dorian? Hi there. Currently I'm with uh, Q West uh, downstairs and we've just built the uh, first Tesla shooting brake. Uh, so the, 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 the Tesla estate car which um, lots of people were interested in when we did the video for Fully Charged. He's one of the very small team involved in that so I personally think that's an awesome car. Uh, Richard. Yeah, I'm uh, Richard Morgan, founder of Electric Classic Cars. We've got a couple of cars downstairs today. Got uh, more than a couple. Well, one or one or two, and a motorbike. Well, Robert's well, driven pretty much everything you've built. I wouldn't say that. We've done about twenty cars. But, okay, he's built. He's driven about a third of what you <laughs> built. Yeah. yeah, he's been in the uh, Red Beetle, Bird. Uh, he's been in the 911, which was difficult to get him out of that car. Uh, and I scared him silly when I took the Ranger over off road, and he uh, yeah went off a mountain virtually in that. He loved that. But uh, my background, actually, professionally-wise, was uh, in the energy industry. So I've been in the energy industry for about 20-odd years, uh, primarily in energy monitoring of large uh, organizations like Walmart, Tesco, Sainsbury's. We did a lot of work with National Grid, with uh, balancing of uh, the National Grid systems like that. So my professional career has actually been in the energy industry and control systems. I changed my hand. And now my hobby. Uh, was always classic cars. So I've modified them, I've hot-rodded them, raced them, drag racing, uh, circuit racing, rallied them. There's not much I've not done to ruin a classic car. And that now includes electrifying them. I am joking. It's the best thing that you can do with a classic car. So presumably you guys have come to watch this because you've got an interest in older uh, uh, vehicles, uh, but you've also got another interest in modern zero uh, tailpipe emission technology. And this is where you can kind of marry these two things together. And it is slightly controversial, and it isn't for everybody. Um, I get that. Uh, I think it's especially good if the person that owns the car uh, lives in an area where it's restricted to a driver car with an engine. Uh, certain countries, uh, you know, center of Tokyo, places like Singapore, really not keen on uh, petrol engine cars. Uh, but, or then, of course, you, or you, you just like the look of an electric uh, a, a classic car, but you don't actually care about what's going on under the bonnet. And I've met a lot of people, mostly younger people, who like the look of, let's pick a car, um, pick a car. Trabant. 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 Yeah, okay. So they love a, uh, love a communist East German car, but they don't want it to have the original smoky two-stroke engine in it, but they want the look. They want the feel but they want it to be brought back up to date and, and, and actually be quite easy to maintain. Because let's face it, the good thing about electric cars is maintenance is much simpler, there's less moving parts, it much gets lower. A, it gets a lot simpler actually when you talk about the electric um, powertrain looking after it. If you consider Trigger's broom, which is uh, the sort of epitome of a classic car, everything's been changed on it and altered within the internal combustion engine. When you go to an electric powertrain, actually the maintenance just disappears. There is hardly any moving components that require the maintenance, and you can get on with the bit that you really want to do with the classic car, which is enjoy it on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. And, and the body work and all of that work, as long as that's solid and sound, you've got a good basis to work for. 
it makes absolute sense to convert to an EV on a classic platform from that point. And it's bigger than that. So at the moment, we're on about 31 million cars on the road in the UK. So 31 million cars, X amount of million, you know, being bought every year. I think it's a rate about, I don't know, just under a mil. You're in a situation now where policy and drive to turn things electrified and, you know, to make a bit of a song for history here, electrification has been in cars since 1837. So this is nothing new. All we're doing now is they had the same problem back then that we're starting to have now, which is infrastructure and network. So we can electrify whatever we want because the electrification process is actually fairly simple. The issue you have then is the wider issue of policy, structure, charging. Um, so I've got a Model X at the moment and uh, went and hung out with all the other Tesla guys this morning in Starbucks while we supercharged. You hung out in Starbucks? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing. But when you look at classic cars, you know, as you rightly say, there are, there are form and engineering functions. We were engineering-led for so long. The design structure of classic cars are so unique, whether they are East German, you know, from Asia, you know, British engineering, you know, big fly flag for design, DB4, one of my personal favorites, and obviously E-Type. Um, this isn't a difficult thing to do, but I think the most important thing for everyone in the room to understand is it's one thing to convert your vehicle yourself at home, but there's actually a lot of safety implications to doing an electric vehicle. Yep. So there is a lot behind homologation, safety cell zones, which were put in by the original engineers of the day. So when you look at converting a classic car, you need to make sure what you do is safe and the components that you buy and the fit and the controllers are all set up correctly. Um, and that's where we're doing some quite interesting work for the future. Um, using additive manufacturing, reverse engineering, and interesting battery pack design, which is homologated, tested, thermally safe, and signed off. Classic cars are anything over 10 years old, so you have a huge pool of vehicles to play with. And I would say that if we really want to be a green, lean machine as a country, and I think we should, you know, looking at the audience today, I am blown away with how many people are here. It's amazing. You can do this because this is much more environmentally friendly than going and buying a brand new car. Because at the moment, that is not carbon neutral. To take a car that's paid back itself over decades yeah. and electrifying it is a much better way to go. And you will save money and get payback so quickly. I love what you did with the rangey, bit of big rangey girl. You're, um, you're biased. But yeah, that's the important thing, you know. You're absolutely right. The greenest car is apparently a second-hand car. Yeah. So you haven't ordered a new car and used any resources to create another new thing, uh, but then by taking out the conventional engine and... Yeah, the conventional engines aren't exactly the most, um, you know, environmentally uh, uh, efficient sort of like uh, engine in the world anyway, let's face it. There's no cats on there. I mean, uh, my old Beetle probably polluted like a chimney uh, before I converted it. But it's, it's one thing about the range sort of things. Uh, you find with the classic car conversions, the, the range is less of an issue than with modern cars because you're not going to get into a you know uh, electric Carmen gear or an electric Ferrari or something like that and cruise around Italy in it. You're less likely to, let's say. So having an electric car that does a 100-mile range or even the little Fiat 500s, 50 to 75 or 100-mile range in London, you'll struggle to do 75 miles in London in a week. So they're a lot simpler to convert classic cars than modern cars, which have ECUs, traction control, onboard computers, etc. So for us personally, we, we like to keep to cars that are pre-mid-80s, where you had traction control and onboard computers, where, where essentially it's just as, as simple as a, an engine conversion. You drop the old engine out, you're putting another engine in. It just so happens it's electric. You drop the fuel tank out, you put a battery pack in. It has to be safe, as Sally said before, but essentially that's all you're doing. It's essentially a, a beefed up engine conversion. Now where things get complicated with conversions is when you start changing also the chassis. You start messing around with the structural integrity of the car um, or the suspension, changing the steering out for a different type of steering system. That's then getting into the uh, murky gray world of seriously modified cars. And there's a point system, I won't go into the details, but if you start getting into that, oh, yeah, then there's a new you've got to go isn't IVA tests and yeah. things like that. 
we personally try to avoid things like that because we just want to convert the cars to electric and maybe upgrade the brakes to be a little bit safer, but keep the essence of the classic car still there. There's another consideration within the classic car market, and it's if you start putting in electric propulsion systems, you start to change the dynamics of that car, and you will have acceleration available that that car would never have experienced on its chassis. Yeah. And yeah. You, you start to push the boundaries of what that car really was designed to do. So you really have to think very carefully about the powertrain and what kind of battery system you're planning to put in there. You've also got to bear in mind, if you go back 10 years, cars had Modbus systems and you could start to just about get involved in reprogramming some of the safety systems on board the car. You've got airbags to deal with, you've got all this lovely good stuff and you have to provide guaranteed 12 volt supplies for certain uh, systems on board. These are things on an old classic car you really don't have to consider because they never had them. But do be careful when going around corners or hitting another vehicle or something because y you will very quickly find the limits of your brake uh, chassis. Uh, uh, the exception to that is the 911. Yeah. When we converted the 911, I mean, I've raced 911s and gone stupid speeds in 911s on tracks, and the classic 911 that we converted actually ended up being safer because we put weight forward, which, and a bit like a Beetle as well. That's the same. true, yeah. You weight move your weight around, yeah. Even on, on a simple conversion in the Beetle, moving the weight forward improves the safety of that car no end for the handling aspects of it. But other cars completely what agree a, What about them. handling? I mean, the, like under... Because the, the chassis obviously was designed for where the engine was placed. 911s is a performance car. The brake setup on it is pretty good anyway. The handling is much better if you move the weight forward. That's kind of about it on the 911. But a Beetle which was, what, 45 horsepower from standard. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't call a Beetle performance car. No. But you know, the, uh, like 15 years ago, 16 years ago, I remember people started with classic cars wanting to put modern technology into them, like Bluetooth hands-free, uh, MP3 players, and, and hide them all so it didn't detract from the, 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 the original look of the car. And now, with, with classic uh, electric cars, you're almost seeing the same thing. A lot of people don't actually lift the bonnet because they're not really bothered. They're not engine perverts. A, so. lot, a lot of the time they don't care. They don't, yeah, they don't. They don't want to. They, all they want to do, is, as Dorian said before, they just want to enjoy the classic yeah. car and not have to deal with the negative aspects of, oh, no, there's an oil leak. Yeah. Oh, it's not running right. It's not starting. Electric. If you can switch on a light bulb, you can start an electric classic car. You can jump down to the supermarket with it and take it out and use it more. Yeah. So you should see more classic cars on the road as a result of electrification. But yeah, so I'm just going to come back to the voice of boring and uh, homologation. The voice of boring? The voice of boring. <laughs> I, I, um, so when it comes to the car itself, then as you said, you can make tweaks within the vehicle and on a one-off that you're going to SVA, that's fine. But if you want to look at on mass conversions, you have to match the original homologation from the day that it left the factory. So for example, if it's a 4951 percentage distribution ratio, then that's the best way to build that car going forwards. It's great. We all know that, okay, the original of a E-Type, for example, not 60, 6.7. I can tell you it definitely goes faster, but it can't. You have to limit these things to what the original car you're using was homologated and safety designed to. Yeah. So therefore, you know, if you're a classic car lover, you've got a way of kind of beating these suicide goal wing funky things on the, on the road by keeping these beautiful shapes out there yeah. for as long as we can. Yeah. But it does come down to, you need a really good base model, Spain, Cyprus, <laughs> always good places to pick up, nice, clean. Don't, don't buy anything. tell everyone, Sally, don't, don't tell buy everyone where to from buy cheap Ireland. cars. Buy nothing from Ireland. They, Nevada, they Nevada's a good the, place. Yes, yeah. Anywhere that involves a trip is always good. Nevada, I'm up for that. On the point of safety, I think it's probably worth looking at who could produce, say, a, de a defined kit for a specific brand of classic car, one that's popular, one that's out there. Who could produce a kit that's verified within the power ratings for that car that a home fitter, a competent mechanic could, could install? Exactly. <laughs> Bosch makes something called the E-Axle. I don't think it's launched yet. It's not out yet, you're right. And, and there might be other manufacturers, but what Bosch have done is uh, built a system which is a plug-and-play, effectively, with its own control system, its own inverter, uh, the, 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 the motor, 
And the battery pack is already there. You can place the battery pack wherever. We, we started doing that already. With the, uh, I mean, we do kits, DIY kits for the VW bus, the VW Beetle, the Fiat 500, and soon to be the Land Rover Defender as well. Fantastic. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're like a plug and play. Yeah. I mean, the Tesla drive system we put in the uh, VW buses, for instance, that's about as plug as play as you're going to get with the sockets on. But we know what a VW bus is like. We know the lengths of cable you need because you can't just crimp a cable, put a socket on. It's not as simple as that. You yeah. need to do it professionally and you need to know what cable lengths, what the cable routes are. So to do repeatables in kit form, yes, we can do it. I'm not keen on doing it, if I'm honest, yeah. because you don't know the competency of the person at the other end, yeah. uh, and also the level of support you have to give is, them. Is it a bit like you can fix your own central heating, but when it comes to like doing the final switch on, you should get a corgi dog to exactly. come and do it for you? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's you can actually like do that. that anymore. I think you have to have a gas-safe engineer from day one. Yeah. yeah. But well, okay, that I don't. Play with my own but you've hit a very point here. Very, very, very serious point here. Anybody who alters their car in any way, whether it be coach building a Tesla or chopping up their car in the street, they still have standards that they have to achieve. I know you've alluded to some of the SVA and single vehicle test, etc. If people aren't familiar, but your MOT. Now, well, MOT obviously two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. The law changed. Right. Now, what does that mean for electric vehicle conversions? If you had a 40-year-old classic car and you decide to put electric uh, uh, powertrain system in it, are you still going to have the same stringent uh, MOT test? You are going to have to have an MOT because it's being customized. Yes. Yeah. But what are they going to do? Are they going to take it back to basics or are they going to just inspect the bits you've done? How's that going to work? I think the bottom line is there are a lot of questions with uh, when you're considering converting an electric, uh, a classic car to electric, and we can't answer them all here now. If you get a chance to speak to these three lovely people today, do so. This is the best place you can probably come in the UK to ask about how you convert an old car in, with 21st century running gear. So ask away. And uh, once again, thank you for buying a ticket and coming here, and I hope you've had a good time. Thank you.